All right. Good to see you, Caleb. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure thing. All right, so let's just start out. Tell me about SoundHound and Houndify, your AI voice technology. Of course. So our company is uh, SoundHound Inc. Uh, we are uh, 12 years old. So we are a startup at 12 years old. We started in a dorm room uh, in Stanford University. I was doing my PhD in electrical engineering and machine learning and speech recognition. Um, we have almost 200 employees, uh, five offices in three countries, um, and we have three, three products. Um, uh, SoundHound is the music app, uh, has 300 million downloads. Uh, we launched it in 2009. Um, and then uh, two years ago, we launched two new products, uh, a voice search and assistant app called Hound, and a developer platform called Houndify that allows other companies to add voice-enabled AI to their own product. So SoundHound, Hound, and Houndify. Okay, so Hound, the app that uses the Houndify technology, what can Hound do that, say, Siri cannot? And could we maybe get a demo? Sure, we'll try to do a live demo on stage. <laughs> Usually it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, this is Hound, it's, uh, it's live, so it's not a staged uh, demo. Uh, you can download it today on iOS and Android. Um, it's a voice search and assistant app, it's powered by Houndify, so Houndify powers Hound, but it also powers uh, many other products. Uh, we, uh, you know, tens of thousands of developers are using it in cars and robots and appliances. Um, we, have, uh, we own all the technologies behind this, so we have our own speech recognition, natural language understanding, knowledge graphs, AI, uh, it took about 10, 12 years to create everything. Um, so we are very proud of building everything. And then we took it uh, one step further and made some innovations that are very unique to us. Uh, the first thing is uh, something we call speech to meaning. So uh, almost everyone else in the industry does this in two steps. They do speech to text followed by text to meaning, which adds a latency. It also makes it less accurate because if you do speech to text and make a mistake, you have the wrong text and then you will send that wrong text to the next step. But uh, we believe you are the only company that has been able to combine speech recognition and natural language understanding and do it simultaneously. So as you are speaking into Hound, we are doing recognition and understanding like our brain. So as you're listening to me right now, you're not doing speech to text, you're doing speech to meaning. And that's how Hound works. So uh, you can do some simple queries like, what time is it right now in Tokyo? It is 3.04 a.m. the next day in Tokyo. What time is it in Tokyo when it's 4.30 p.m. in San Francisco, California? So you can see the latency almost doesn't exist So uh, because we do speech to meaning in real time. So as soon as you're done talking, we have the response. It's very fast. Yes, and the other thing we do is um, we have a technique called deep meaning understanding that allows us to understand very complex conversations. So if you ask Siri, for example, show me restaurants except Chinese, uh, it shows you Chinese. It shows you exactly what you did not want because they do keyboard detection based on, uh, based on the question. Uh, but with Hound, we have a new approach that allows us to understand much more complex questions. So you can ask something like, show me Asian restaurants, excluding Chinese and Japanese, and only show the ones that have more than four stars and are open after 9 p.m. on Wednesdays. Showing five Asian restaurants with more than four stars that are open after 9 p.m. on Wednesdays, excluding Chinese restaurants, Japanese restaurants, or sushi bars. And then you can follow up. <laughs> you can follow up and... Uh, Refine, so I look at the result and I can say, sort by rating, then by price, then by distance, remove Korean, and only show the ones that have Wi-Fi and are good for kids and have a patio. Okay, showing one Asian restaurant that provides free Wi-Fi, is kid-friendly, and has outdoor seating excluding Korean restaurants. So as you can see, there's only one restaurant, so I got exactly what I wanted. <laughs> It's very impressive. <laughs> so what inspired your vision for voice technology when you started working on this more than a decade ago? Yeah, so when I started my PhD at Stanford, I made two conclusions. Uh, the first one was voice-enabled AI will happen. So we will talk to everything, and they talk back to us, and we talk to them again, and we have a conversation just like Star Trek and Star Wars, right? So I decided that will happen. My second conclusion was that it will happen within my lifetime. Right, so and that was very important too because I know we will have a hotel on the moon one day, but maybe not within my lifetime. Uh, maybe we will, thanks to Elon Musk. Uh, but I thought voice enabled AI 
voice enabled AI will happen, it will happen within my lifetime, and I want to be the one doing it. Uh, so we started the company in the dorm room. We uh, spent you know, more than a decade on this technology. And you know that vision is kind of obvious today because it's happening. But you know, 15 years ago, this is before iPhone, this is before smartphones. Uh, the world was very different. So uh, we really had this long-term vision that it will happen and we wanted to be the one doing it. Great. And you recently raised $75 million in funding from big investors, KPBC, Samsung, NVIDIA. What do you plan on doing with the funding? Yeah, so we summarize our mission in two words, houndify everything, which means add voice-enabled AI to every product. Uh, now, houndify everything, everything is everywhere. So uh, we need to add new languages and new regions for our platform. So the big uh, use case for our funding is uh, globalization. Uh, but there's also a bigger story here, which is, uh, so we haven't really, you know, our company's 12 years old, but this is the first time we announced our funding. Um, but we kind of announced everything from the beginning. So in the first 10 years, we raised less than $40 million, um, which says a lot because the companies these days raise 40 million and spend it in a year. Uh, but we added so much value, you know, 200 people, over 100 patents, in a massive technology portfolio, 300 million downloads. So we were really careful in our spending. Uh, we also made, always made money. Uh, but this really was the time we felt we need to go big because we were ready and the world was ready at the same time. So that's why we raised that big amount. Okay. And how do you pitch investors on how to buy? It was actually very simple. Um, so in 2007, 10 years ago, every company needed to have a mobile strategy. The ones that did have a mobile strategy created value, and the ones that didn't have a mobile strategy fell behind. Now in 2017, 10 years later, we think every company needs to have a voice-enabled AI strategy. Those who will adopt it early will create a lot of value, and those who don't, we think, will fall behind. So we created a platform to enable every company in the world to have its own strategy in voice-enabled AI, and I think that pitch was very compelling. So how many developers are using the platform? We, uh, we are a little bit over a year old in terms of opening the platform. Like, we worked on it for more than 10 years, but we opened it up um, uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we have uh, we're almost 25,000 partners or developers on the platform. Half of it has been the last quarter, so the rate of adoption uh, is, is increasing. And what sort of products are integrating Houndify? We are counting about 1,000 uh, unique, pro distinct products that are using our platform. Um, there are 11 car companies, uh, and that's a big number. Like, there are not that many car companies, so 11 is a, is a big number. And that 11 is 11 of the 1,000, right? So 11 car companies, and there's tons of appliances, connected speakers, uh, robots, mobile apps, enterprise applications and so on. Wait, is it what you envisioned the technology would be used for? Well, we, we predicted, uh, well, we thought everything needs to be handified. So wh whether it's a hardware or software or a database, every product can benefit from voice-enabled AI. Uh, but we predicted cars will adopt it first because voice in cars is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, it has existed, now we pr provide a better uh, solution. Uh, and then connected appliances is kind of the second uh, tier of products that we predicted and we are seeing that. Um, but we're also surprised by some applications that people are building games, um, they're using it for education, for healthcare, uh, very unique ideas. It's just like the mo mobile app stores, when some of the app ideas were obvious and then we saw millions of apps that were not obvious, so we are seeing kind of the same pattern in our platform adoption. So let's talk about collective AI. I've heard you talk about this before. What is it and how does it work? Sure, so we have, um, uh, we have this architecture we call collective AI, um, and the inspiration is that we all want some global AI entity that knows everything. So you ask everything about recipes to finance to healthcare, at entertainment, it knows all the information in the world. And the way to get there is to um, accumulate ma a massive knowledge graph. Um, 
And the collective AI architecture allows us to uh, have contribution made to this knowledge graph and have the understanding capability increase exponentially instead of linearly. For example, the way uh, companies like Amazon uh, or Google are doing it, uh, uh, their understanding capability increases linearly. So if you add 10 skills to Amazon, another 10, another 10, you end up with 30 skills because these skills don't really interact with each other. But the way we do it, uh, our domains interact with each other. So as people contribute to it, it gets exponentially uh, uh, smarter. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, so let's say we have three developers. Uh, and one developer adds uh, uh, understanding for locations. So you can say, where is San Francisco? Here is San Francisco. So it, or, or you can even have a street address, like 3979 Freedom Circle Santa Clara. Here is 3979 Freedom Circle Santa Clara. Now let's say a second developer comes along and wants to add uh, a domain for Uber. And uh, he wants to enable cost estimates, like how much does it cost to go from here to there. Uh, and he doesn't have to reinvent the concept of location. So he can use the work of the first developer in his domain. So he can just write, write maybe a few lines of code. So he can say, how much does it cost to go from San Francisco to San Jose Airport? And UberX can take you from San Francisco to San Jose International Airport for about 62 US dollars to 82 US dollars. So this was very easy for this developer to add because he used the work of the first developer. Now let's say a third developer comes along and adds uh, data from Yelp to our platform. Uh, and by the way, these developers don't have to talk to each other. They don't need to know each other. They don't have to talk to each other. But the Yelp developer can extend the location domain and then the Uber domain automatically becomes smarter and understands more complex questions. So uh, I can say, how much does it cost to go from San Francisco airport to the best American restaurant in San Francisco that has more than four stars and is open after 9 p.m. on Wednesdays and is not a chain? And UberX can take you from San Francisco International Airport to State Bird Provisions located at 1529 Fillmore Street in San Francisco for about 28 US dollars to 36 US dollars. Uber Pool, Uber Assist, Uber XL, Uber Select, Uber Black, and Uber SUV are also available. So this happened without the Uber developer doing anything. Like he went and added a few lines of code and he went away. And as people added to this platform, his domain automatically became smarter. So this is what we call collective AI. Great. So you bring up Google, Apple, Amazon. You have some very big competitors with huge resources. Um, how are you going to compete with these companies and what are you doing to, differently to stay on top? Uh, yeah, so um, we, do, we don't expect to see a lot of competitors in this space as, as a platform provider uh, because it's not practical for new startups to do 10 years of R&D. And so it's not because other people are not smart. There's tons of smart people out there. But it's not practical to form a startup, raise funding, and do 10 years of R&D to, to build a platform. So, um, so that's the good news. Um, the bad news is our competitors will be these big companies that we, you know, Google, and it's kind of scary, right? Um, but we have two angles. Um, one is superior technology, right? So we claim our technology is superior, and we prove it. So it's not like, hey, we are better. We actually prove it uh, uh, very quickly. Um, our second angle is uh, we don't have some hidden agenda to hijack your product, right? So companies like Google and Amazon, they're doing great work and they're adding a lot of value, uh, but they want to own your user, right? So if you integrate their platform into your product, your users become the user of Google or Amazon and your brand becomes you know, hijacked and all the data when they speak to your product goes to Google and Amazon and they own it. And that is their agenda, right? So we don't have that agenda. We never compete with our customers. We allow you to keep your brand, keep your users, keep your data, differentiate and innovate. So a better technology and um, this kind of independent uh, approach has helped us attract tens of thousands of developers. If Apple approached you and wanted to use the technology to improve Siri, would, is that something Soundtown would be open to? Absolutely, yeah. So when we say, Handify everything. Um, we don't have any prejudice against companies that might compete with us. So 
actually would like that very much. <laughs> they might be doing it already, you know, with anonymous email ad address on our platform, and we won't know about it. So the platform is open. Anybody can go and sign up and start using it. Great. And why is being independent so important? I think the world needs an independent platform in <coughs> voice and built AI. And uh, I think that's very important, and we hope to continue to be that independent uh, platform. Um, I think it's, you know, everybody talks about AI can be evil, and I think people can be evil before AI becomes evil, right? Uh, and I think if AI is owned by a handful of big companies, I think that's something that we should be more scared about than AI becoming evil. So we would like to be this independent platform to bring AI to everyone and let them, let everybody own it and contribute to it. Um, curious if you have any advice for other entrepreneurs out there that might be going up against these big competitors or you know, companies with huge resources. Um, is it worth trying to compete with these companies? Any advice? Uh, I mean, yeah. Were you scared? You must have. Did you know that Apple was working on Siri and Google was, you know, all these companies were working on the same technology when you started? Uh, yeah, so when we started, we were one of the early ones. Um, I think Microsoft definitely has done it for longer, like for decades. But I think when we started it, uh, we did it before Apple, before Amazon. Um, we knew that our vision was big. So if other big companies didn't do it, it would actually be a negative point. Um, uh, but um, what I learned was that you can't be scared of competitors. You can't be scared of Google and Amazon. Um, you should think of them as variables in a very complex equation. So you should be aware of them. So you should watch their moves. And as they make announcements or um, you learn more about them, the variable in the equation changes. So you just need to update your strategy to be able to uh, cope with that. Uh, so you shouldn't be scared, but you should be aware. Um, and uh, you should also be practical, right? So um, there has to be a path to success. And I think with better technology and the independent approach, we do have a path to success. Uh, so being practical is also very important. What were some of the biggest challenges in developing this technology? And, and why did it take so long? It, it takes that long. So when we started the company, we, well, we, we said we, we want to be a leader. And to be a leader, we need to own the technology. We don't want to be a system integrator. We don't want to go license from 10 companies and put it together. Um, and, and we knew it was going to take 10 years. That's why and we did it in stealth. So working on something for 9, 10 years without talking about it is actually extremely difficult, right? Because sometimes you need, you need to talk about it, and you need people to say, wow, right? And that gives you energy. Um, and we didn't even have that, right? So people said, what are you working on? And we couldn't talk about it. So that was like painful. <laughs> um, so we knew it was going to take a long time. And um, um, we were fortunate that we could take some of the technology out of uh, our research and, and launch a music uh, um, technology. And that became successful. And I think that was helpful to uh, give us some satisfaction, um, help us attract more funding, uh, more talent, and also teach us how to build good products. because. Our DNA when we came out of you know, a dorm room at Stanford was we were really good at technology, but learning how to build really good products um, and appreciating design and UI and UX, I think that's something that we had to learn. So uh, it was very important to do that. And what are your thoughts on the advancements in AI in the past couple of years, and why is it such a hot topic lately? Uh, well, yeah. I think the negative thing is a lot of people are using AI for um, um, in a wrong way. So they're using the term AI as a marketing uh, phrase, um, even if they don't have really AI. So they just use it, and um, and then the, the world is kind of buying it. Um, I think that's kind of negative. Uh, but there is good work that people are doing, and uh, I think deep learning was uh, uh, a big advancement. So it really changed um, some of the things that we, we couldn't really do well uh, until like three or four years ago. Um, so we heavily use deep learning. Uh, but we also added our own um, advances, like uh, speech to meaning is very unique to us. And I think that, uh, in fact, 
speech to meaning had a bigger impact on accuracy than deep learning. So deep learning usually improves by 20 to 35% in speech recognition. Um, but speech to meaning actually improves uh, the error rate by 50%. That's when we combine the understanding with uh, recognition. Uh, and then our approach to NLU or natural language understanding, um, uh, we think is phenomenal. Uh, it's for the first time, uh, people have complex conversation with each other, but we've been trained by Google that we, sh we shouldn't expect com to have compl complex conversation with uh, technology, right? We lower our expectation. Like, I might ask someone in the audience, hey, do you know any coffee shop within walking distance that has Wi-Fi and is not Starbucks and is open after 2 p.m.? And you understand. Uh, but when I talk to Google, I don't talk like that because I have lower expectation. But we thought, what does the future look like? The future looks like Star Trek and Star Wars. When we have complex conversation with technologies, the same way we, ha we talk to each other. And I think our, ap our approach to NLU really allows us to get there. Great. And what are your thoughts on the trends of the home assistant robots? They were everywhere at CES. Everyone had an Echo competitor. Um, is this just a trend, or do you see this being, you know, are we all going to have a robotic butler eventually? Um, I am personally very passionate about robots, um, so I want to see that happen and see it be successful. Um, I, think, um, uh, I think it will happen. Um, you know, Amazon showed that people like to talk to a little box. Uh, so I think if that box had eyes and face and moved around a little bit, uh, we would actually enjoy interacting with it more. Uh, and we are seeing a lot of robots on our platform. Uh, and robots without voice-enabled AI, I don't think they're as compelling. So our platform is very compelling for, uh, for robots. So, and I think robots that do um, really specific tasks can come to our lives really fast, much faster. Like if, if you're expecting a robot that is like a human being and does everything, I think that might take longer. But if they are very specialized in some tasks, um, I hope that we'll see that a lot faster. Is Houndify in any of these Echo competitors? Uh, yes, we are uh, seeing a thousand distinct products, and a whole bunch of them are Echo competitors. Uh, one of them was announced um, at CES, uh, but there will be more. So that's kind of our partner's announcements to make. So we are patiently waiting for them to get ready and announce, and we'll support them. And how will the average American be interacting with voice technology in five years, in 10 years? Yeah, I think you will wake up in the morning and you talk to everything around you until you go to bed. Like you, you talk to your alarm clock and then you go in the kitchen, you talk to your espresso machine and your espresso machine will make you coffee and while it's making you coffee, you can ask it for the weather and for the game scores and stock markets um, and then you talk to your TV, then you go in your car, you talk to your car, you go in your office, you talk to your computer and your IP phone. Um, so I think every, every aspect of our life is going to be voice enabled. And it's not just voice interface for commands. They have some AI elements inside it. Like they, they know things, they know more about you, they know more about the world outside and they can be very useful. I think that world is going to be, you know, just better, just a better world. Have you thought about the dark side of everything being houndified? And, um, you know, I think that case, I, I forgot where it was, but the judge wanted data from the Echo in a yeah. murder case, mm -hmm. and um, Amazon would not give that data. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, have you thought about kind of the dark side or too many people um, going to have? Yeah, um, I think any anything can have a good side and bad side and, and AI. It could be dangerous. Um, again, I think people who use AI can be evil before the AI becomes evil. Like, I think Skynet, well, before Skynet happens, I think you will have people who are doing evil things with it. Uh, so we just have to be careful. And I think having an open platform that gives flexibility to product creators and the end users uh, and the developers is very important. And we've architectured our platform to be exactly that. So if you're building, a product and you want to use our platform, you don't have to take it as is. You can actually disable features, enable features, and you can do it on the fly. So you can build a robot, sell 10 millions of them, and, and then after you've sold them, you can go on your dashboard and modify the AI brain behind it uh, in real time. What about privacy concerns? You know, if, if our bed is listening to us and mm -hmm. our espresso machine, um, 
how, how can we get people comfortable with the fact that all these products are always listening, or are they always listening? So um, there is a local recognizer and a cloud recognizer. And I think people will be more comfortable with the local recognizers because it's not really streaming your voice to some cloud. Um, so the devices will always locally, rec locally be recognizing until you address them. So when you say, you know, with Hound, you can say, OK, Hound, and it wakes up. So it's always listening locally for that phrase. Or with, with Amazon, you know, it's Alexa. Or with Google, it's OK, Google. Um, and I think that's OK. So a local recognizer that's always listening is OK. Um, and it's not really saving that. It's just it's an, in a loop. But after you address the product and you say, OK, Hound, or Alexa, or Google, then they stream your voice to a cloud. Uh, and I think people should be aware of that. Uh, but there's, it's very similar to when you search on Google. Like when you put a query into Google, that query goes to Google Cloud. And it gets stored in their logs. And if you search for something that you're embarrassed about, uh, you know, they know about it. Um, now, this, this will also have your voice attached to it. So um, it's a bit of a step change. But I think it's very similar in concept. Will it be stored in the cloud, everything we're saying? And Something that, say, a judge could look back on if it... Yeah, so um, um, it will be... Well, every product needs to have its own privacy policy that is very transparent. So if they're storing it, uh, they should tell you. If they're storing it and associating it with you, they should tell you. Most products store it but anonymize it so it can't get tracked to you. Um, I also think uh, that um, the case that you're referring to, um, I don't think any data... What, my opinion is that there was no useful data that Amazon could give them because I don't think the person who committed the crime, if they did commit the crime, uh, said, you know, hey, Alexa, how do I kill a person, right? So I don't think they asked that question. So um, it was listening for an Alexa keyboard to be recognized, and that was a local thing. Um, so again, I don't think there was any uh, data that would have been useful in that case. So what's next for you and for SoundHound? What are, uh, what are the plans for the next five, 10 years? Well, we uh, are going to stay focused on our mission, which is Houndify Everything. And I think that's a, I know it's a short phrase, but it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, so we'll stay busy and we'll globalize, we'll add new languages, we support our partners, we add new features to our platform. We keep improving our technology and we hope to see lots of great products that um, um, improve everybody's life. What do you, what do you think, um, how can Houndify improve lives the most? What are you most excited about? Uh, yeah, so um, taking a lot of services and making them uh, so easily accessible um, uh, and more of, doing more of that uh, will improve life. And I personally experienced that. Like I travel a lot for work and um, you know, I, um, I expense my business trips, so my company has given me a budget. Um, and uh, so if I know, let's say I'm going to Seattle tomorrow and I want to stay there for three nights, and let's say my budget is, you know, 300 to $400 a night, and let's say I would like to exercise in the hotel, so not all the hotels have a gym, so I only want to include the ones that have a gym. Let's say I want to go swimming in the hotel and not all the hotels have a pool, so I want to the hotels that have a pool. Maybe I want to bring my dog, so I want hotels that are pet friendly. So without our technology, my only option is to go to some website, do some keyword search, click on every result, and uh, it might take me 30 minutes. Uh, but with Hound, I can say, show me hotels in Seattle for tomorrow, staying for three nights that cost between $300 and $400 a night, and are pet friendly, and have a gym and a pool. So I give it all the information. Showing eight results with availability in Seattle for tomorrow, February 23rd, staying for three nights between 300 US dollars and 400 US dollars per night that are pet friendly, have fitness facilities, and have a swimming pool. So I got exactly what I wanted in like five seconds, and I think that improved my life. And there will be a lot more of these, like taking all these services. Or when was the last time you wanted to, uh, you know, choose if you're, you're landing in San Francisco airport and you want to know if you should ask someone to pick you up or get an Uber from, you know, there to your office, right? and you wanted to get the cost estimate. Do you know how to get a cost estimate from San Francisco airport to your office when you're not in San Francisco airport? There's no way, right? Uh, or it's very difficult. But with Hound, 
How much does it cost to go from San Francisco Airport to 3979 Freedom Circle? And I'll get and the. Uber X can take you from San Francisco to 3979 Freedom Circle Santa Clara for about 58 US dollars to 77 US dollars. And I got the cost estimate immediately. So I think that improves life. <laughs> Great. All right, well, we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you all for listening.